information. This is a, a, a new way, I think, of sort of a new way, certainly for me, to think about prologue. And I want to emphasize this as prologue as the programming language. And so I'm thinking about how we might introduce the mathematics that underlies the pro prologue programming language. So let me just get started. I'll jump in. Um, the prologue is a, is a language, I would argue, for defining sets uh, inductively, PF1 and PF2, then PF1 and PF2 is in the set of propositional formulas, PF1 or V symbol PF2 is, is a propositional uh, formula, and tilde PF1 is a propositional formula. So this is defines the set of propositional formulas an inductive definition. Nodes reachable from a graph, uh, from uh, in a graph from node A, uh, a is in the set of nodes reachable. And if B is in the set of nodes reachable and there's an edge from B to C, then C is the, in the set of known reachable, reachable nodes. Okay, so formulas provable from axioms and inference rules are, the axioms are in the set of provable. And if the, uh, the rules say that if some Form, provable formulas are in the set, then another formula is in the set, is provable. So these are all examples of inductively defined sets. Okay, so what mathematically, what are these things really about? Um, well, we want to define a closure operator on a set, U. So U is the universal set of, of things, and a closure operator is a pair where the first thing is a subset of you and the second thing is an element of you, okay? So that's a, called a closure operation, a closure operator. Uh, an example is let you be the set of all strings over, um, uh, let's see, what's this? So uh, the set of all strings over A, B, and plus, and then we can define closure operators, and matter of fact, we'll define infinitely many just for fun. Um, if we, if the, if X and Y uh, is in U, then X concatenated with plus concatenated with Y will be in U. So this is a closure operator um, on U. Uh, and this is, as I mentioned, there are infinitely many of them here. Um, a set is closed, a, a subset of the universal set is closed under an operator if whenever the set is a subset of A, then the element of the operator is in A. Okay, so this is a simple idea of a set being closed under an operator. That is, if the set of the operator is a subset of a, then H must be in A. And then if that's the case, then we say um, set A is closed under the operator A. So an example here, the set of all strings over plus, all strings of plus is closed under each of these infinitely many operators here, right? If you take any two sequences of plus and put a plus in the middle, you get another sequence of pluses. Okay, so that set is closed under uh, all those, that infinitely many set of operators that we uh, mentioned just above. Okay, so if P is a set of operators on U, then let's define F sub P as the least subset of S that is closed under all the operators of P. Okay, so that's a, that's a definition uh, an example here is if let's extend our operators, we'll take the infinitely many operators um, which concat would put plus between two elements, and we will put uh, A and B in the set. So here the we have the empty set as the set required for A to be in and B, and then the, the least set that's closed under all of these 
operators is the set of expressions or uh, plus expressions over A and B, right? That I think is reasonably clear to those of us. Okay, so so what are some facts about this FP, this least closed set uh, over a set of operators P? Well, the first thing is that it's well-defined. That is, I called it a least thing and it's unique. There is a unique least closed set. Um, and that's easy, pretty easy to see. You just, if you uh, think of two sets that are closed under P, then the intersection of them is also closed under P. And once you have that, then of course, there will be a unique one, a least one. Um, okay, and so now let's, let, let, let's, def let's think a little bit more, go a little further in things about these least closed sets. Um, so we will define an operation, a T, we'll call it the TP operation on sets. And that is, you take the set A, you look at all of the uh, operators in P, and if the set of the operator is a subset of A, then you take the H of the that operator. So that's just collecting together all of the, the targets of these operators whose antecedent sets are in A. Okay, so it just collects together the result of applying to the input set all the closure operators. And so now we all, we'll give another definition of P. Uh, we hope it will be a definition. It's the least fixed point of this TP operator. As that, what that, does that mean? That means that FP, if we apply this TP operator to FP, we get FP back. That means it's a fixed point. And there is no smaller set subset of FP that has this property of being a fixed point. So it's the least fixed point. And uh, how about some more depth? So that's another depth. No, I'm sorry, that's a definition of TP operator. So now let's define, give other definitions of FP. Um, so we will define this iteration of the TP operator. So the zero iteration of the TP operator is the empty set. And the I plus first iteration of TP is applying TP to the ith iteration of TP. So it's just applying TP over and over again. And surprise to logic programmers, it shouldn't be too much of a surprise that FP is the union of all of the of this of all of these TP operators. Of the results of all of these applying TP to the empty set again and again and again and unioning all of them together. Okay. Don't we, excuse me. Don't we need transfinite powers? Um, here, I don't think we do. No. In in well-founded semantics, we do. We're not, we're not doing well-founded semantics. These are all monotonic operators, right? We haven't talked about negation at all. So this is a very. This is we're just doing sets and. Operate positive operators. This is monotonic. This all this this everything converges at omega. Uh, monotone and continuous is necessary for uh, for for uh, for uh, for the uh, fi uh, for the finite for the natural numbers natural powers to being enough. If it is only monotone, then we may need transfinite powers as well. Okay, this is these are also continuous. That's right. Okay, so um, and let's give another definition. We defined TP and used it. Um, another sub definition we want is the concept of a justification. So an element of U is said to be justified in P if there's a sequence of elements of U whose final element is A, a justified A, and for every element H in the sequence, there is an operator of P such that where H is the target, B, this set B is the antecedent in the rule, 
Um, and it's such that every B in that B, every element of that precedes H in the sequence. So this is a sequence of elements of, of U such that for every element in it, there is a rule that justifies it to be in it. And those, the antecedents of the rule appear earlier in the sequence. So here's an example with our, of our, the one example we sort of used. A is in the sequence. It, it, if you remember the rule, it, 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 it was an empty set. So it doesn't have to have anything before it. It can just come into the sequence. B can come into the sequence for the same reason. Now, A plus B can come into the sequence because it, we can use a rule that puts A and B with a plus between them. And so this is a justification sequence of the last element of it. And it's a justification sequence here. I'm just, I'm, actually, I've just pictured it. So this, we think of this, this sequence is from top to bottom is, is the left to right, A, B, A plus B, whatever. And here we, can say, see, we A and B come in without any antecedents because they have empty sets in there. A plus B comes in because we have A and B already. A plus A plus B can come in because we have A plus B and A. A plus B plus A A plus B can come in because we have A A plus B and we have A plus B. And finally, this one can come in because we have uh, this and A. Uh, I'm sorry, and B that we put, I guess, at the beginning of it. Okay, so another definition, potential definition of FP is a set of X's such that X is justified in P. There is a justification sequence for um, X. And so if we look at all of the possible X's such that there is, it has a justification sequence and collect all of them together, the claim is that that's also FP. Okay, so the exercise, of course, is to prove all of these things are equivalent. That this that these four definitions of a set all define the same set. Um, and I would argue that this may this is probably a, this proof is probably a stretch for undergraduates. But it should be doable by first year grads, I think, because um, these are relatively simple concepts. As a matter of fact, it was an exercise that I had as a first year graduate student. It was given to me in my logic course. So, and that's where this comes from, from my background. 1972, uh, 73, I think. So, so I could use, I guess, fixed point induction and those type of things to... These are, this is, this is the, as I see that this is the mathematical underpinnings of the, of that concept, of those concepts. I'm, did you, I'm sorry, did I, is that, oh, well. I'll, you know, no, 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 go ahead, go ahead, David, yeah, yeah. sure. Okay, so now there's one more concept. So those base, those are sort of very simple ideas about this least closed set. The, concept of a very simple operators and then the least closed set. Um, and I want to give one more complicated, a, a bit more complicated, still just a, a, a mathematical, simple, relatively simple mathematical definitions. And this is, I want to talk about parameterized inductive definitions. Um, and so here, so, so, I, so to do that, I need to make a few, again, some notation. Uh, let's let HP for heads of P. You can, I use H to think of, to, and I call that, I use the H because it reminds me of the head of a, of a closure operator. And I use B as the set of body, B for body. That comes, as you imagine, from me thinking of these eventually as being prologue related, but that's just my notation. So, I'm going to use them to call, I'm going to call these things heads and the body set. Um, so H, let HB be the set of heads. Okay. Uh, it's a set of heads of rules. Um, and so a, a very tiny bit of thinking shows that the 
FP will have to be a subset of the heads of rules, right? You can't get anything in the least set that isn't the head of a rule. Um, and so intuitively, you can sort of think of, of P, that's the set of rules. It's, their, it's P's responsibility to find the right subset of its heads. This is maybe a little, trying to give a little intuition as to how one might think about P a parameterized uh, set of rules. And so in a pa parameterized inductive definition, a set is a set determined of a set is, de is determined by a set of closure operators and a parameter set P. So we want to start with the set C and then use the closure operators to define more elements, knowing that we already have C. And this is a bit of notation that is, is probably not necessarily to try to figure out. It's trying just to be formal in saying what, uh, what this parameter set is. That is, it's the least set that contains C and is closed under P. Okay, so it's, so here now this P is parameterized by this set C. And you can have, you can use the same set of uh, closure operators and give different parameter sets, and then you will get different FPs out of it, FPs of C. And so you can think of this as um, the, that you, you augment, augment the set, uh, the program P by adding operators that treat the elements of the parameter set as facts. Right. They just get thrown in all, you know, immediately and always. So it's parameterized by a, a set. Okay, and a set C is an allowable parameter set if it doesn't intersect with the heads of P. That is, and that sort of intuitively makes sense, that is that C doesn't impinge on P's responsibility to find the right subset of HP up here. P is supposed to be defining the right set of HP, and C can't jump in and automatically give you some subset, some sets of, of uh, you know, some elements of HP. That's P's responsibility. It has to give you some other elements. So, as to, to reiterate, C provides facts that P uses in its definition of its subset of HP, of its the heads of its rules. And so we were only going to be interested in parameter sets that are allowable. Um, yeah, so we will just always constrain and uh, parameter sets to be allowable sets. So if we take a picture, try to look at sort of a, a, a graphic picture of what's going on here, um, we have the universe, uh, some big set, and we have a set of closure operators, P, which have, here we have some some um, heads. And so we can sort of look. So HP is a set that contains all the heads of these rules. So here are P, P, Q, R, S, and I have dot, dot. There may be others, but at least they have those. And then just to think, of, in my thinking, hanging off of each of these is the body of a rule with that as a head. So we can think of those body things as maybe making the the head be in FP. So FP will be some subset of the HP um, that have the, you know, that are they're in the least closed set. Okay, so that's just HP. Okay, now we might have a, a parameter set. So if we're thinking now of P as a parameterized definition, we have a parameter set. And that will have some elements of you in it. And those, the idea is that these parameter elements will be used in the bodies of these rules. And therefore, we now, the FP of C with that parameter will be bigger than the old FP because now we will have more of those rules firing and we'll get more things in. Okay? And this is allowable. It's this C is disjoint from HP. That's important. Okay, does that sort of give a bit of an idea of the 
of the idea of a, of a parameterized uh, inductive definition. Okay, so where are we? Well, to this point, everything is just discrete math. There's no programming. There's It's all set theory, right? It's just very simple, basic set theory. A little bit, I mean, we have to think about uh, infinite unions. So there's a, it's not trivial, but it should be, as mathematics, quite simple uh, to, for, for undergraduates to understand. I would argue that this might actually even be appropriate to teach in a discrete math course. You know, as a, we teach a discrete math course to our undergraduates. We teach a lot of stuff about set theory. And this is, I think, important, interesting set theory that uh, computer science students might ought to know. And it could be done there. It, it doesn't need any anything else. Okay, so now we're, so we're, what do we want to do next? Well, next we want to, so this is what we've seen so far is for discrete math students. Now we want to talk about for computer science students. And what do computer science students want to do? They want to do have algorithms over about these sets, but they want to be able to compute properties of these sets. So the first interesting property is membership. We would like to be able to compute if we're given a set of operators, closure operators, and we would like to say whether a particular element A is in FP for that for those operators in P. Okay, so one way to do that is we can start with the empty set, repeatedly add elements that are required to be in the set by the operators of P until the desired element is found or no more elements to add. Okay, and we can write a little program to do that. Um, we start with the empty set. We do forever. We let, uh, we, we take, we basically apply T, P to S, that is for every head in a rule such that the body is a subset of S, we add, we can collect all those together into S1. If we found the X we're looking for in there, we found it, it's in the set and we can return true. If the set we constructed is the same we started with, then we're never gonna add anything more. We haven't found it, we're done. We have to return false, return false. Um, and otherwise we update the S and do it again. This is not surprising. This is called, we call this bottom up. Um, it uses our definition of FP of the union of the TP operator, iterated TP operator. And we can prove this correct by using, by using this definition of, of FP. Okay, and as I said, it applies the TP operators and applies them to nothing new. This is called a bottom-up operator, out of computation as we all know. Okay, there's another algorithm one might try to compute element to, to compute membership in FP. And this one's called top-down. Here the idea is to see if X is in the set, we look at each operator that might apply X, at, might add X to the set and see if all the elements it's in its uh, body condition are in the set. And if so, then that means that X is in the set. Now notice this is a recursive um, algorithm to show that something is in the set. We have to call, call it recursively, check whether something else is in the set. And so this is just a little, uh, simple algorithm for propositional, for all, everything in propositional, uh, you know, atomic elements in the set. Um, I've added this little log X here, which just means to log, write out X. Once you, if you get to this point, write X out and keep it in a log. The reason I do that is because what's the basis of this being correct? Well, if you, look at this and how this program executes the and look at the log it produces, that log will be a justification for X. So since we know 
anything that's justified is in P, then that proves that this algorithm is correct. It's based on our definition of justification of, of, just, of FP being the set of justified elements. Do you need to check for loops? Uh, oh, it doesn't. <laughs> uh, that's a good question. This is called top-down or backward chaining. It turns out that this algorithm loops sometimes, just as Paul pointed out. And for example, if we have this operator set P goes in, the, the set P as the body and P as the head, this operation says that if P, all of the things, if P is in the set A, then P must be in the set A. Just thinking about that's a stupid rule. It doesn't, it'll never add anything. It only would add something if it was already there. So it's completely useless. We completely throw it away in theory, but it's a rule. It ought to work. Well, it doesn't, right? So this, this goes into infinite loops in some cases. And we as prologue programmers know those cases, but students may not yet. Okay, so, so this algorithm loops sometimes. So we might have another, we might try to find a better algorithm for this. Okay, so I would argue that there is another algorithm that we could look at, which is top-down testing with tabling. Intuitively, you can explain this as, well, one of the, if we look at that previous algorithm, it, every time it wanted a new, it needed to just a new thing for its justification, it would re-justify it. So you basically, so the justification that you build may have the same thing in it justified a hundred times. Well, that seems like a waste. Don't keep justifying it. If it's in the element, if it's in this justification sequence, use it. Right? Okay, so tabling does that. So you can think about tabling as a way of using the things you've already justified so you don't have to justify them again. You'll still construct a justification sequence. It'll just be a shorter one, maybe short. Okay, so I don't want to go through this whole thing. It's, it's trying to delay. This is what I would try to explain to students at a high level of how tabling works. Here is a... Uh, a sketch of an algorithm that does tabling. I'm using this, um, it, it's recursive, in depends on in, and it also uses this funny operation when. And so this implies a suspension. You need to, you suspend, and when this becomes true, then you re come back to this point and return it. So it's rather complicated. It's it's not a simple procedural um, algorithm, but it, it you know, more sophisticated language, uh, this you know makes sense. Anyway, so this is a it's an idea of of maintaining a table, uh, and then suspending on uh, elements to see that when elements show up in the table, then you can return. Okay, so so here now I try to explain why this looping rule doesn't loop here, and it has to do with the fact that when you suspend and try to compute it, it will, no answer will ever show up. And so you'll be finished computing everything with no answer, and so you stop. And so that's the idea of how that terminates, how tabling will terminate that thing we saw as an infinite loop on the previous one. And it will terminate all infinite loops in this proposition case. Okay, so now where are we? Well, we've now done discrete math, talking about FP and all the ways FP can be defined. And we've talked about algorithms, how we can compute membership in FP. So this now might, these, these last three slides might best be done in an algorithms course. We've had discrete math and we understood now the mathematics of these um, at least fixed points. Um, and we, now, in our algorithms course, we could say, ah, this is an interesting discrete math problem. What interesting algorithm can we uh, write for solving an interesting problem in, in, in this in discrete math? Okay, so next. Well, now we want to go to do 
uh, programming language students. Now, when we're getting into a programming language course, now we want to talk about a programming language based on this concept, these concepts. And we call this pro -like programming language prologue. So what about prologue? How do we start giving meaning to prologue? Well, we start with a propositional prologue program, right? And this uh, is, should be obvious to us prologue programmers that a propositional prologue rule is, is actually can be modeled, formalized as a closure operator where the head is the head of the operator and the, the set of uh, propositions in the body is the set, the condition set in the closure operator. I'm mean, just looking at this, it's, it's obvious what it is. <laughs> Trying to say it makes it hard. Uh, maybe because I don't have enough, I haven't thought clearly enough about the right language to talk about closure operators. I'm using the prologue language, so it sounds like I'm saying the same thing over and over again. Anyway, so that's uh, that's what a prologue propositional rule is. It's a closure operator. The propositional program is the set of closure operators determined by the prologue rules of the propositional program. The meaning of a propositional program is FP. The program P is FP, the least set of propositional symbols closed under P, the set of closure operators P. Um, and if we're thinking logically, and we'll think a little more about this going on, we can think of FP as the set of true propositions. Since these are propositions, it's a set of true propositions determined by the program. It's exactly the set of propositions provable from the operators considered as facts and rules. Okay, so that's propositional. It's all, it's, that's pretty much trivial. But now what about real prologue, right? Real prologue has variables and real prologue is more complicated. So what's the, so what, how do we extend this idea or use this idea of inductively defined sets with prologue? Well, what's the issue? Well, the main issue is what's the carrier set? What is the set U for prologue programs with variables? Okay, it's not just simple elements, which are proposition, we have just simple indivisible element symbols. Those are our elements in our set. But with prologue with variables, we can't just use those individual symbols. Prologue has structure. So what, what is the set of things that are, we are inductively defining in? The U, the universal set. Well, yeah, a little bit of thinking. It's the set of named records um, where a constant is a named record, a number is a named record, or it is a record name followed by a sequence of named records. Okay. So these are uh, a set of structures, simple tree structures, right? named tree structures. Uh, actually, you can notice that this itself is an inductively defined set, but that's an aside. Uh, and this is also known as a set of labeled, ordered, rooted, finite trees over constants and numbers. It's also might be called the set of general expressions, where an expression we think of a, of a, of a, of a it's the, over a set of operators and the Record names are the operators. Um, and so these are expression, general expressions. Um, if you're a logician, you could call them the set of ground terms or equivalently the set of ground atomic formulas. Those are exactly the same sets, okay? I don't wanna use one of those terms because it makes you think, you logicians then think of them in a certain way. I don't want you to, I want you to think of them as expressions, right? They're just expressions just trees. So I will call them expressions to keep you from being confused by atomic formulas or terms or those logical concepts. We don't have logical concepts here yet at all. We have just expressions. Okay. So prologue, so the claim is that prologue is defines inductively defined sets over expressions. 
So it's the set of all expressions and it defines subsets of the set of expressions. Okay. So again, this becomes obvious in a, it, it should be obvious if you think about it for a couple of minutes, but again, a prologue rule, rule determines the set of ground instances and each of those ground instances is a closure operator on the set of expressions. Okay, I'll let you just parse that for a second. So we think of a prologue rule as we take a grounding of it, and now we have the head as an expression, and the body is a set of expressions, okay? And that determines the operator, which is the set of expressions to the expression, okay? So we can look at an example. Uh, here's a prologue rule. It's one we all know and love. And so it determines a ground instance. Here's a ground instance of a rule. And so this now becomes a closure operator that says that if this tree member with first subtree five, second subtree, the cons of four, da, da, da. If that's in the set, then this subtree, this expression tree is in the set. Just a closure operator. And then the meaning of a prologue program is the least is FP. The least set of expressions closed under the closure operations determined by the ground instances of the rules of P. Okay. This is but I think, you know, if you strip away all of our baggage that we've been carrying around and look at just this, this is actually quite simple, right? We do have to understand, we have to understand closure operators and least fixed points that we got in discrete math. <laughs> and we now have to do, do generalize that to think about not just atomic sets of atomic elements, but sets of trees. So our universe is a set of trees, but this is now just the, Closure. And this, okay. And then a query to a program just asks for instances of Q in FP. So where are we? Well, we have a full mathematical theory of the meaning of positive prologue programs. Requires only simple set theory. We do have to understand trees provides a foundation for proving correctness of bottom-up and top-down evaluation of prologue programs, because we have those algorithms that find members of FP. And I clearly am fudging something quite important here that I would like to point out. And that is that we don't compute with ground programs. The theory computes with, talks about ground programs, but we don't compute with ground programs. So we have to somehow talk about, we have to go back to our algorithms and talk about how we compute with, with programs that have variables in them. And the intuition there is we do lazy grounding. We don't have to ground at the very beginning and then use the algorithm we did before. We use, uh, we have to do lazy grounding. And that's a, I'm, I'm not belittling that, meaning that difficulty of doing that and the complexity of doing that. That's a very important part. But for the theory, it's not that important. And I think the, anyway, I'll, I'll let you worry about, think about and come to your own conclusion about how much I'm fudging here. I'd like to argue I'm not fudging a whole lot, but maybe I am. Okay, so this gives the correct meanings. To the, an interesting thing about this that jumps out about this immediately is that you get the right meanings for meta programs. Right? Because we can put variables as elements, you know, in our, in, in the head or in the body of a rule. Those are just, that just stands for the set. So this, you know, we just take all ground instances grounding X to an expression and we get a set of closure operators that we use and it all works. 
And it works exactly how Prolog does. Well, the first one does, the second one doesn't quite, and that's because Prolog doesn't allow, at least any Prolog, I, all Prologs I know, don't allow variables and heads of rules. Theoretically, it perfect, makes perfect sense. And here's a perfect, here's a rather nice example, I think, of where it would make sense, right? H is true if there's a clause with H and B, and B is true. So maybe we should extend prolong to allow this. There are other issues around here, but again, from the theoretical point of view, this is all makes all wonderful sense. High log programs make good sense too. We just have to general to change the definition of expression slightly. So we have high log expressions, but then all of the high log stuff works. Um, another thing that I've always found important and interesting is if you take any prologue program and you take a universe, you take a, 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 a unary symbol, predicate symbol, we would call it, and wrap every single term in your program with that unary predicate symbol, you get an equivalent program, right? Uh, how does that, that doesn't work in logic. Right. But that works here perfectly. It's exactly simple, straight, obviously correct. Okay. So I want to add one more. So again, I'm, maybe I'm, how am I doing on time? Come on. No, Oops. Okay. I got to go quick. Okay. So we can use pro parameterized definitions to support program components. We talked about, remember I spent a little time doing parameterized definitions. Let me uh, go quickly through this. I think it's important, but it, it's not fundamental. Uh, so, so let me, actually let me, uh, so, so the idea is that we can break a program, a prologue program into components where uh, one component is a parameter to the other component. And a canonical example in my mind is transitive closure. We have the transitive closure rules as a component, and we have the edge facts as parameters to that component, right? So we can make sense of the, of the just the two transitive closure rules as a meaningful program, as, but it's a parameterized program, and it's a parameterized uh, inductive definition. And so since we know what an, a parameterized inductive definition is, we can know what a parameterized prologue program is. And that gives us a way of breaking prologue programs into pieces and putting them together. So, um, so that's what this tries to say. Uh, and a program then is a composition of its components. Okay, let me let, let me not spend too more time on that. Uh, it's not that complicated, but it uses the concept of parameterized, uh, parameterized inductive definitions that we did talk about earlier, and it just now applies that to programs since programs are inductive definitions. Okay, and so here's the picture that we can now do. Here's back to a transitive closure picture where we this is our universe, our program, our heads, which have are all the TC transitive closure atoms, a uh, trees, uh, expressions. Um, and we have the rules that define the ground instances of the rules. Uh, FP in this case is empty because we have, every, you know, there's, we don't have any ed edges defined. So if we just take FP of the transitive closure rules, we get the empty set. Okay, not interesting. Uh, however, if we have, uh, another uh, set disjoint we have that that define the edges and use that as a parameter to fit. we then get okay well and as a matter of fact we can this parameter set can be defined by its own rules as long as we're careful about the allowedness and then we put those together and we get this fp2 defines the edge relations, and we use that as a parameter to this FP1, we get what we normally get with a transit closure applied to that graph. Okay, this may be getting 
So let me leave that. Negation, how does negation come in? Well, we can extend the operators to add negative body literals that have to not be in. Um, we can, we, we talk about components now and a component, a program component is negation safe if the things that it looks at in its negations aren't in the heads. That means it can be done in an allowable subcomponent. And if there is a way of partitioning your, your program so that all of the negations are in allowable components, you end up having a stratified program and it makes sense. So we can, again, I'm waving my hands here, but it's not too complicated, I believe, to using use the concept of, of program components and, is, and then to define negation as having to apply to a, a lower program component. It can't comp apply to a component you're defining. It has to be complied, applied to a lower program component. It can be applied to edges, but it can't be applied to transitive closure in your transitive closure definition. Okay, I'm running out of time, um, but I would argue that this gives uh, meaning to stratified negation programs. And, and if you think about it, these are all, these would be locally stratified. Notice I have not said anything about logic yet. Okay, so where are we? We have a mathematical theory of the meaning of stratified programs. The theory is compositional over program constructs. Notice that the, the, that the standard prologue semantics is not compositional. You have to have the whole program to give a meaning to the transitive, the two transitive closure rules have no interesting meaning. They're always empty, right? The FP is always empty. So the standard definition of semantics for a prologue program is not interesting for the transitive, the two transitive closure rules. You have to have the edge relation. Here you can get the meaning as a parameterized uh, inductive definition. Okay, uh, the theory is composition. Um, there's no closed world assumption. Notice I don't say closed world anywhere. Where does closed world assumption comes in? Well, it comes in as in the fundamental idea of an inductive definition, of an inductively defined set. It's the least set closed under the operators. So it's not external to your definition. It's intrinsic in your definition. And we have the foundations for three computation strategies, uh, bottom up, top down, top down with table. Bob noted in his talk, something that I that struck me, which was that I think what he said is something to the effect that mathematical computer science students don't like prologue. Mathematicians don't like prologue. And I would argue that this might be, this might help. This is a mathematical theory that mathematicians, I believe, can relate to, which gives a meaning, a reasonable meaning to prologue programs. Okay, so what about logic? What's this got to do with logic? And you as logic programmers should know, it's all really pretty obvious. I was just trying to keep you from thinking about logic until now, but now I'll let you think about logic. And what is it? A program determine a set of ground expressions. A ground expression can be understood as representing a ground atomic formula. Ah, now we come in and talk about ground and atomic formulas. So now we think of an expression as a ground atomic formula. A set of, and so a prologue program determines a set of ground atomic program, uh, atomic formulas. A set of ground atomic formulas determines a hairbrand structure. It's exactly those that make those atomic formulas true and all other atomic formulas false. We get logic. Uh, it determines if I say, that's what I said. Um, it's also the set of atomic formulas provable from horn clauses. That also becomes immediate, is immediately obvious. So we get, we get our logic back. And it's very simple once you have all of this machinery. Okay, so I would argue that this has some, this approach has some advantages for teaching prologue. It will give students a firmer grasp on the mathematical underpinnings uh, it depends on familiar, well-understood mathematical concepts, set theory, which I believe is accessible to undergraduates. 
We don't need to go into deeply into first order logic with models, satisfiability, refutations, proof theory, da 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 da, da which is all wonderful and great. And I'm not diminishing, I'm not saying we shouldn't know that and learn that and recognize that. I'm just saying that you don't need to do all of that in order to understand, I think, prologue. And so, and getting, and I would maybe argue that this may be a good way to lead into teaching more about logic. Maybe, maybe not. Again, I've emphasized before, no explicit closed world assumption. I think that's a great advantage. I think it makes it much clearer what the closure idea is. It's the closure idea is not some amorphous multiple way of applying some weird thing to an entire program. It's it comes with the inductive definition. Um, it supports programming intuitions, I think. Uh, Metaprogramming is naturally and correctly characterized. Sort of the one way of thinking about it is that prologue computes logic in two steps. It first computes the expressions and then it uses the expressions to determine the logic. And if you think of it that way, then all of the stuff makes sense. Things like believe John P. P is an expression. Believe John P is true if John believes an expression, which is intuitively right. And Bob pointed this out. And this approach, I think, explains why. And it's right that John doesn't believe a proposition has a true or false. He believes an expression of a proposition. Anyway, I'll be done. Is this a reasonable approach to introducing prologue? I don't know. I think so, but I will admit I have not taught a course like this, but I would like to. <laughs> Questions? <laughs>